So um, I, what I'd like to do this evening is talk about the Lord of the Lord and the Lord of the and talk to someone about Reese as well as uh, talk about Reese and get people to be a message when they do it and play with those other kinds of things. And you can tell you that you love every cloud on a very dark side. And I know that how many people want to play with those things? 50 minutes, which was Stuart Jang, the president of the Jockey Club, that gave uh, his opinion of what was on behind the scenes. So let me go back to the beginning. Um, the horse, first of all, um, it seems that uh, Alan McDonald and the Harvey Alvin believe that the horse dates back as many as 15 million years. Was the size of the door, and they didn't have those who had hooks. So it was a four way animal and long with this tree. And eventually, uh, it was called back to the game. Uh, it was the bodies, and when the time went on, the development grew, it became larger. And even we in the North America think that the use of that was the only thing. The work of grass is like that. And maybe not the name, obviously, but having been destroyed by the rains of heat. However, they did exist in other kinds of the world, the customers of the particularly in Turkey and the Iranian areas of the world, and even the Nordic areas of the world, they did actually move through the ice age. Bottom line is that uh, the four legged animal. We go to the last advantage of the folks. We have what's called a spoke on our brain force that forming the problem is a crunch of its own fur. And then you might just put all the cracks and give them other problems. But uh, in return of the horse to North America, we came about 1400 with the comments of the horse. And that really came from the next battle. And all the way the Indians uh cash came off and realized that they found for many things and I think you all know and put them back in the shoulder and ride the horses and using them to uh carry the welcome and change the game to the horse to put the common. Today we have three hundred and fifty squad to read the horses. So Congress wants to turn the green, obviously, this is their selective green. And there are maybe people with the full bloods of hot blood or the warm bloods, and the warm bloods are being turned off in the image. What can be those by the colder insects, those first of the cold colds, and those they survive the difference of the cold colds. A bread is in warm blood. A bread is in a cold. So that you can look at the variation of types of forces, two distinct types of forces, categories of forces. A lot of people, as we just said, developed, they became used for utility, agriculture in particular, riding, transportation, etc. I've often read that the most prosperous societies had the help of a horse. And if one thinks about that, I can believe that it is a very true statement. In times of peace, the horse was bred for agriculture, for doing those things that were necessary during peaceful times. In times of conflict, the horse was bred to carry a warrior, and that warrior was equipped with armor. So the horse had to be big enough and strong enough, but yes, agile, yet agile enough to be able to navigate. So you take that combination of uh, horses in various destinations and for different reasons in the world, you had a whole group of horses and nothing really that was perfected to be called a thoroughbred. So let's get on to that subject tonight, which is the thoroughbred. And let's get on to the other subject of racing. 
Racing uh, is actually recorded to have started in the year 1174 in England. And not until the 1700s did it become prominent and known as the thoroughbred racing. And it was King Charles, and racing is predominantly an English sport, and Queen Anne were the two that gave it its prominence. King Charles, in particular, uh, created what is called the Jockey Club. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But what had occurred simply was that you had horses in England that had come from north of England and were really reasonably sturdy horses. And then people began to use them to ride and they began to race. But they wanted to perfect the breed. So King Charles and those of wealth brought in stallions from Turkey, Syria, and Yemen. And there are three foundation stallions of which all thoroughbreds, which race today, we can find the DNA of those three stallions. And they're named Herod, Eclipse, which is a name you hear quite often, and Matcham. Eclipse, Eclipse is the horse that most thoroughbreds relate back to. In fact, they say as many as 95% of thoroughbred horses today have Eclipse blood in them. So these three base stallions were bred to the royal selected mares. These were mares that royalty owned. And you have to remember this sport is, in fact, the sport of kings. And this is one of the reasons it gets its names. In 1750, King Charles developed what was called the Jockey Club, which is a registry of horses. So a horse has a mother, which is called the dam, and obviously the sire. And that combination of mother and father is recorded in the Jockey Club since 1750. And to this day, that Jockey Club uh, exists. It's parenting in England, but as well is here within the United States. So if you want to race a thoroughbred, or you want to have a uh, pure thoroughbred, you have to be registered. That particular horse has to be registered with the Jockey Club. So... Um, Moving on, let's just tell you a little bit about what this sport contributes to the United States. Uh, today, it contributes $122 billion to our economy. Of that, $80 billion is in the form of salary and wages. And throughout the world, it's a $400 billion economy. Quite a bit of money. In terms of purses in the United States, we have one over $1 billion of purses at different racetracks. Now, I want to make something very clear. Um, a thoroughbred is a horse. And that's the only thoroughbred there is, a horse. You say, I've got a thoroughbred dog. I've got a thoroughbred cocker spaniel. No, you don't. You have a purebred dog. There's only one thoroughbred. It's a horse. And King Charles was, in fact, the one that created the word thoroughbred for that very reason. Now, there are other horses that you see racing. They're called standard breads. What is the difference between a standard bread and a thoroughbred? It's the gait of the horse. And you say, well, a standard bread, there's two types. There's a trotter and a pacer. What's that difference? Well, a trotter moves his left hind and his right front at the same time. If you can kind of figure that. And a pacer moves both of his lefts and both of his rights at the same time. What's the difference between that and a thoroughbred? A thoroughbred literally doesn't touch the ground at all when it's in full flight. If you take pictures of a thoroughbred and Thank the good Lord to have some of those, particularly when they're racing. They're like a Pegasus. They're flying. They have no foot on the ground whatsoever. So that is the distinction between those horses. 
The thoroughbred is the one that has the jockey on his back. The trotter is the one that has the sulky behind it. So how do we select the mother and the father? That's an art within itself. Um, sires, stallions, as you know them, you've heard of bull ruler, you've heard of secretariat. Those are the big names you hear. Well, there are hundreds of sires in the country. And there's a stallion registry in which you can go in and look at like a phone book. And these horses, those show what their record was, what they did, and potentially what their brand, what they potentially could produce, what their grandmothers and grandfathers did. And all these things come into play. And statistically, you can uh, make a science of this as well. And then you look at the other side, you look at the mayor and you see what success that family had or what success she had. And you put together what you think is the perfect mating that you can afford. Now, let's talk about affordability. Stallions, um, at the height of his career, uh, Mr. Prospector was getting $300,000 every time he bred a mare. Not a bad sum of money. A more recent horse, uh, Tappet, is getting the same amount. Today, he's down 186000 To get older, it kind of drops a little bit. But the bottom line is you can get stud fees as low as $500, and you can get stud fees for several hundred thousand. There are two types of stud fees. They call them guarantees or no guarantees. A guarantee is that uh, your mare will have a foal by that stud. There's a lot of fallout, which I'll talk about in a moment. So if your mare, uh, if you buy a guaranteed season, you have to put the money up and you're guaranteed that your mare is going to have a foal. And if she doesn't, then you can come back the next year and breed to that horse, kind of like an employment agency. Hey, if this employee doesn't work out for you, we'll send you another one. Um, the no guarantee is a little different. It's speculative, meaning that you can breed up to five times, but if she doesn't conceive, tough luck. Well, there's insurance you can buy for this. So that's another part of the game. And at the end of this, I'll be happy to answer any questions about any of these things I'm talking about. So you can buy insurance that will guarantee that your mayor is going to have a fall. If she doesn't, you'll get your stud fee back. But of course, you pay for the insurance. So let's continue the process. Um, thoroughbreds can only be bred by actual physical sex. Uh, standard breads can be artificially inseminated, meaning that they can freeze the semen, send it anywhere. It's diluted, but it, it has enough semen in it that they can impregnate just as they do with cows. However, when it comes to thoroughbreds, that is not allowed. It must be actual and physical. So you have these stud farms that are all over the place, particularly in Kentucky, but you have them other places as well. And that's an interesting uh, subject in art as well. And if you, maybe if some of you have actually bred or uh, gone to uh, stud farms to watch the breeding activity, it's a, it's a rather interesting one. I'm going to just give you a quick open that door for a minute. So you have a stud who's been very successful and everybody wants to breed to this stud. Well, if he's a really good stud, they're going to say, well, that mare is really not good enough. Uh, we're not going to accept that mare. But let's assume that you have a mare that's acceptable to the one who owns the stud and you're willing to pay the stud fee. So you pay the stud fee and your mare comes into season. Well, what is season? You know, what a dog comes into season? Well, a mare comes into season, but it's usually around the beginning of the year. But a thoroughbred has a birthday on January 1st. You have to be very cautious about this, and I'll get into the details in a moment. So your mare may go to the breeding shed, as it's called, around 
February 15th, because it's going to take 11 months for that gestation period to take place. And you want your foal to be born, okay, so that you get a, a full year of age out of it, meaning that it'll, it will be born sometime after the first of the year. Because it was born on December 29th, on January 1st, it's considered a year old. So you've got a big disadvantage. So anyway, um, let's just talk about the stud farm for a moment. So they have these studs that are treated royally. And years ago, they used to limit it to 44 breedings a year. That's all changed because there's so much money to be made in breeding that they breed as many as 144 mares in a year. And a stud will breed as many as three times a day. So you know they're giving him a lot of juice, a lot of Viagra to make him be able to pr produce what he does in terms of semen and energy. And they start out in the beginning of the year rather heavy, and by the end of the breeding season, they're pretty thin. So the mare is prepared and they wait till that special moment. There is just a particular peak that she's fertile. And they bring what's called a teaser, which is um, not a stud, but he's been gelded. And gelded means that he's been castrated. And he's been castrated what they call long, meaning that there's still some of his cord there. So he kind of thinks he's still a stud, but he can't really perform. And they'll have the mare in a stall, and they'll bring this guy up to her, and he gets all excited. And if she lifts her tail, just like a dog when it's in heat, she's ready. So she's prepped and she's all juiced up, pardon the expression, but she is. And then they bring the stud and they put a big leather um, tape on her because the stud is going to mount her. And on that leather are pieces of leather standing up and when the stud mounts he wants to bite her neck so instead of biting her neck he bites his leather and he breeds her and you hope that she conceives and if she does uh, 11 months later you'll have a foal so maybe you didn't want to have that little look into it but I always think it's kind of interesting because everybody thinks ah it's so simple it's not uh, there are so many things that can go wrong uh, many of them don't conceive, many of them abort along the way. There's a lot of things that happen. But if you're fortunate enough, you will have a foal 11 months later. Um, that foal is going to be called, if it's, a, if it's a male, it's a colt. If it's a female, it's called a filly. When it becomes four years old, it's called a horse. And if it's been castrated, it's called a gelding. And after four years old, it's called a mare. Up until that time, it's still as I suggested. The horses that you see in the Kentucky Derby are three-year-olds, so they're colts. So you can name it, um, and if you're going to race it, you better name it. And you're allowed 18 letters, including spaces. Uh, you, so you see some very creative names. I was talking to a gentleman in the audience said his uncle used to name his horses, and they were called in something or other, and um, all of us seem to have a little knack. I like to name them after my kids and my grandchildren. So you can name a horse just about anything as long as it's acceptable. If you come up with a name, uh, I had a horse named Sister Fanny. I bought the horse. Um, and I wanted to name the next horse with the word Fanny, and then they rejected it because they said, no, it's objectionable. Uh, I had a horse named, uh, her name was Super Jewels. I wanted to name the full the Family Jewels. It was rejected. Uh, so uh, it, it's it's kind of an interesting uh, and fun thing to do, and it's kind of a family project sometimes as well. So let's kind of move on. Um, at seven to nine months, the foal is weaned from its mother, and it continues to grow. And as I suggested, no matter what, on January 1st, it's going to have a birthday. It's going to be a year old. So you try to plan that breeding after, as I said, February 15th. But horses, 
don't always cooperate and sometimes they're born, but after July 4th, you don't breed any longer. Not that she wouldn't conceive, but you don't breed a thoroughbred. So you continue to progress and when they become a year and a half old, you start to train them to have someone on their back and you're looking forward to going into the racing world. You now have an animal that weighs between 1,000 and 1,100 pounds. You're feeding it five quarts of oats a day. It's eating seven and a half pounds of hay. And it's drinking enough water to urinate one and a half to two gallons of fluid. It sleeps three to six hours, sometimes standing up. It doesn't always lay down. Smarter ones lay down, by the way. And if it's in training, it exercises one to one and a half hours a day. And the rest of the time is spent at its stall. There are over 100,000 thoroughbreds born in the United States each year. Of that, 60 to 65% only of those yearlings will go on to be trained to be racehorse and only 50 will actually make it into a race. Of that 50%, only 5% will make any substantial money. And it's all based on ability and you begin to judge what your horse is potential is as you go through this process. The average racing life for a horse is two to three years of racing life. You say, yeah, but I saw this horse, he's eight years old. Yeah, he's the exclusion. He's, he's the anomaly. Um, their, usually their career ends when they're about four or five years old. Why does it end? A variety of reasons are mostly injuries not life-threatening injuries, but injuries that make them not want to run any longer. And some of them are smart too. They say, I've had enough of this. I don't want to do it any longer. A uh, staggering statistic is that the most recent ones that I could read, and believe me, anything you read, you can, you can look elsewhere and you can find another statistic. So I could be criticizing what I'm giving you, but I can only tell you what I read as well. Um, horses that race, make an average of between 30 to the high of $53,000 a year. But remember, they've got a two-year career or three-year career. So that certainly doesn't cover your all expenses. When we say 53, that's the average of a New York horse that's racing in New York. The average number of starts, meaning how many times does it go into the starting gate and how many times does it race in a year is seven and a half times, only seven and a half times. So you're not gonna race every week. Standard breads are different, they race them quite a bit more. So now you've gone through uh, the trials and tribulations of uh, spending a lot of money and um, you hope that you have the potential of a horse that's uh, going to be able to race and uh, you enter into the next phase, which is you've got to give them to a trainer. So you might have done all preliminary training on training tracks and you're getting somewhat of an evaluation of your horse, but only until he gets to the racetrack you're gonna know when all of the other activities going on and how does he compete with other horses. And you put your trust in a trainer. So you select a trainer. There are many reasons you will. One may be affordability. The better trainers are gonna get more money. And I'm going to tell you what kind of money they get, uh, which is staggering. So if you're at a, a lesser track, and I'll talk about tracks in a moment, um, the trainers might be charging you $70 a day. That's about as cheap as you're going to get it to train your horse. Now, what does that include? He feeds the horse. He does whatever's necessary. His grooms are taking care of the horse. But it's not including your vet bills, it's not including your farrier, it's not including any transportation. If you're in New York, where the purses are big, you're going to be paying $120 a day. Wow, that's a lot of money. Yeah, it is. But everybody's you know, reaching for the stars and everybody thinks they got the Kentucky Derby winner and this is what keeps the sport alive. There are, um, if, you're, if your horse makes it to the races, there are 58 tracks that are under what's called the National Thoroughbred Racing Association, NR, NTRA, which controls the rules of racing. New York being one, Monmouth, as you well know, being another, 
tracks in Florida. Some of you are familiar with being those. And then there are what we call bull ring tracks or fairs and things of that nature that really don't come under that jurisdiction. But there is now a new one out there, which is what you heard about on 60 Minutes, which is called HISA, H-I-S-A, which is a Horseman's Integrity and Safety Authority. And this was approved by Congress, and their rules and regulations are extremely strict right now. And I can get into those details if anyone's interested, because it's the rather lengthy of what we have to go through now in order to race a horse. One of the things is, if I'm going to race a horse five days from now, I have to have a veteran veterinarian examine the horse five days prior to his racing to be sure that he is sound enough and he'll be examined again the day of the race to be sure that he's sound enough to race. So this is one of the newer restrictions that have been put into place. So you are now an owner uh, and you're paying these bills and you're hoping you're going to cash in on a big one. So what do you have to go through? You have to register yourself as an owner uh, years ago it was a lot more difficult than it is today when i first did it was that i got my owner's license in 1966 i was a younger man back then um i had to be uh, interviewed by the fbi be sure i had a clean record and it was very specific as to what was required today it's a little more lenient and we see a lot of people slip into the sport that really don't belong there. So now you're registered, you're an owner, and every state you have to take out a license in that particular state. How do you identify, how do they identify you? Well, they identify your horse, I should say, by the silks that a horse wears. So many of you see and are familiar with, oh, I like, or your wife in particular, my wife in particular, oh, look at the colors on that horse, let's bet that horse. Well, that comes from England as well. And they're called silks and they identify and they actually goes even beyond or before it was actually times of war. They would identify themselves with the colors of what basically team or country they were on. Well, fast forward, um, now you identify your horse and your ownership by those silks. Um, you can have different silks in different states, but once you you have to pay to register them, particularly in New York, costs you $100 a year to keep your colors. So there can't be identical colors, obviously, and they discourage there being blue because blue looks too much like black, but that's just a side note. So here we are. We're ready to race. We've gone through all the trials and tribulations. And we've tried to equate what kind of value our horse has. Well, in the morning, he's working out. And there are clockers that are hired by the racetracks. And the clockers are incredible people. They sit in a stand and they watch every horse. And they can identify a horse by simply looking at it. I find it amazing. I find it absolutely amazing. I mean, we look at each other and we have features that kind of stick out you know that guy's bald that guy's got hair yeah you know. um that guy is old that guy's young these horses have not as significant a markings but these clockers are very astute and they, they make notes and every horse that comes on a track they can almost identify it by name and there are other things sometimes the trainers have um blankets that they use or saddle cloths that they use that have their name on but these clockers are watching the horses and the horses have to have what we call recorded works. So the recorded works are a kind of a giveaway as to who's the fastest horse. And you begin to determine what level your horse uh, might be able to compete at. So then we kind of get into um, what are the variations of types of races you can get in. Most of you are familiar with stake races. Well, it's exactly that. The word stake means that you have to put up money for your horse to be in that race. It's a stake race. The Kentucky Derby, the Triple Crown, these are stake races. You have to put up money. Um, so how much do you have to put up? Well, it depends on what the stake is. Stake depends on what the purse is to a great degree. 
and also eligibility. So in order to qualify in the Kentucky Derby, which only allows 20 horses in it, um, you have had to earn points by being in stake races that are prominent and your horse would have had to have won a good majority of those races. And while years ago, you can kind of pay your way in, you can't as well today. The Breeders' Cup is another one, which is a very interesting one. Those are horses that come from all over the world. And to get in those races are rather expensive as well. And I'll even allude to that for a moment because I had the good fortune of being in the Breeders' Cup with one of my horses, which did not win. But um, the horse paid his way in, and I'll talk a little about him later on. But just to run in that race cost, cost my horse and me $60,000 just to enter into that race. But the purse was $2 million. So if I had won, it would have been well worth it. So there's stake races, and the largest one in the world is the Dubai World Cup. The value of that race is $20 million, one race. $20 million purse. But we're going to talk about how they break that purse up in a moment. The next category of race is called an allowance race. What is an allowance race? It's bigger money. It's a step below handicap or stake races. But um, you have to have certain qualifications to belong in those races. Non-winners of this, non-winners of that, winners of this, winners of that. But your horse is yours in the last race, the last, I'm sorry, category is called claiming race. Claiming races are the most prominent of all races in the United States. And this is where we can get lost for the whole evening talking about this. Because every time the subject comes up, I get invited to talk, as I did this evening. Um, what is a claiming race? Your horse is for sale. Why would I put my horse for sale? Because he's not a stake source and he's not an allowance source and there's one, only one other place you're going to be able to compete and that's in the claiming rank. Well, the claiming rank basically has handicapped your horse at a value. You handicap your horse at a value. So let's give you examples. In this country at, let's say, uh, a big racetrack, the cheapest a claim race would be, be $4,000 of value on a horse. But then we have expensive claim races up to $200,000 in which you can put your horse in. What does that mean as it's a claim race? Your horse is for sale and anyone who is qualified at that track, at that meet, can put up the money and say, I'm buying your horse. How does that all occur? Well, there's a slip that you have to fill out. And that slip has information on it. You have to have absolutely perfect. You have to have the horse's name, how much you're willing to spend, which is the value of that horse, which is already determined. It could be $25,000, it could be $100,000. You write that down. And you write down all the essentials, which is maybe if you're stable and who your trainer is, and you have to sign your name. You take that slip, it goes into an envelope, it's sealed, and then you go up to a box, which is called the claiming box, which up until 10 minutes before the horses come out of the stable gate, you can drop this claim slip in, and you theoretically have bought a horse. Well, a lot of things can happen between now and then. Three other people decided they wanted to buy the same horse. Well, three other people have claim slips for that same horse. Now, you ask the question again, why would you put your horse in a claim race? Why don't you want to keep your horse? Well, you got to pay some bills. And if you got to pay bills and you can't win a handicap and you can't win an allowance, the only place he's going to win is in a claiming race. Now, better find a level that he can win at. Can he win a $100,000 claiming race? No way. Can he, can he win a four thousand? Yeah. Or can he win a a twenty thousand? Yeah, maybe. Well, if I run him for fifteen, he'll probably win. But if I run him for fifteen, he's attractive to everybody else in this audience. So that's we are the people who are claiming me being one of them. We're making determinations. It's wow, maybe this is a good buy. Here's a horse in today for 
fifteen thousand that probably worth twenty. You know, maybe I'll take a shot. And it's, it gets a little complicated. There's a lot of other aspects of it. And I can answer those questions later on individually or to the audience if you'd like. But um, let's say that you drop that claim slip and you're all excited. That horse runs and that horse wins a race. You say, oh, boy, I just claimed the winner of the race. You're not going to get any money. The last guy who owned it is going to get the money. But he theoretically doesn't own the horse anymore. You go into what's called a racing office where they take all these claims out of the box and they've checked to make sure that you've got your money in account and you're registered and all the other baloney that goes with it. And they say, you know what? There's three people that want this horse. How are we going to determine who gets it? So now they take these envelopes, you put the claim slips in, they turn them upside down. Nobody knows what's in the envelope. They write one, two, three. Many times it could be as many as 20. 20 people want the same horse. You take three Ouija bowls in this case, you shake them up, pull out Ouija bowl number two. Number two, open the envelope, La Marcus Stable, you just won the horse. Okay, the other two people walk away disappointed because the horse won the race. Or maybe that horse came in last, and the other two people walk away, oh, thank God I didn't get that. So that's the claiming game and briefly. Now, what did you get? You might have gotten a horse that somebody wanted to get rid of because this horse was starting to show arthritis or he might have had some other sort of an injury or he's just not performing. It's it's a crapshoot, but it, it's it's a wild crapshoot. And I'll just give you a perfect example. Um, I play the claim game rather heavily. Some years back, I've done this a few times. I claimed the horse. I saw a horse show up that a very wealthy owner. And he put the horse in for $25,000, but he hadn't raced in six months. Well, when it, don't race in six months, you have a suspicion. There was something wrong with this horse. He put the horse in for $25,000. And I said to my trainer, I'm taking a shot. I claimed the horse. And the horse won the race. Okay. Then he said, well, let's run him back. We'll run him back to Larry. I said, no, you're not. We're going to run him an allowance race. Ran him back. He won the allowance race. Fast forward, that horse went on to win $800,000. And that's the horse I went to the Breeders' Cup with. So once in a while, you can get lucky. But more times than not, you'll be unlucky. So that's a little bit about the claiming game. And I hope that is meaningful to some of you who go to the racetrack and say, why is this horse in the claiming race? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, let's talk about purses. You don't get $20 million if you're in a $20 million race. Let's say the purse is $100,000. Okay, the horse won the race. is $100,000. Now, in New York, the race could be a $100,000 purse. So I use that because it's a round number. So you won the race. Oh, great. I won 100,000. No, you win 100,000. You're going to get, in New York, you only get 55%. Most tracks you get 60. New York, you're going to get 55% of that. You're going to get $55,000. Oh, well, I got 55,000. No, you didn't. The trainer's going to get 10% of your 55,000. The jockey's going to get 10% of your 55,000. And there's a stake that you give all of the people who worked at a barn of 3%. So, and then the track takes all kinds of money away from you for aftercare of horses and all kinds of other things that they gimmick up. And so let's use the 60%, which is the normal number that's used. And the, the equation comes out to this, that you're going to wind up with about 75% of the 60%. So if you took a $100,000 purse, in a 60% arena, you're going to wind up with $45,000. Now, how much did you pay for the horse? Well, that's a crazy number. But Joshua Fusachi Pegasus is a horse that they paid $70 million for. Uh, he went on to win the Kentucky Derby. He went on to be a stud. There's another horse called the Green Monkey. They paid $14,000 for it as a baby. 14 million, I'm sorry, 14 million. 
Worth never won a race in his life. And and they put it into stud, and the baby's never won a race in his life. This is the craziest game you could ever enter into. But it marches on and on and on. And people, people are feverish over this. You go to Saratoga, and some of you have, and I challenge you to add up. They actually show you how much horses have sold for at auctions as yearlings. Now, a yearling means you're just a year old. You have not proven anything other than that's my mother and that's my father. And I look good. I have nice confirmation. I haven't done anything. Two-year-old sale is something different, but let's just go to yearlings. And these people pay crazy money. I mean, crazy millions today, but there's that kind of money around. There's a, there, there are different levels of money in this world and you learn it when you're in the horse business. And there are people with so much money that the fame is worth more than the money. So I've kind of given you a little insight as to what the purse structure is like um, and told you a little bit about the, the trainer getting 10% plus what he's getting on a daily basis. And the jockey gets 10% of a win. He gets 5% if he comes in second and then it kind of graduates down with a scale. Jockey doesn't go home with all his money. He's got uh, an agent, which is always kind of interesting. An agent, they are characters on the racetrack, and they are characters. Um, actors and actresses have agents. They are always trying to find the best movie that their actor can star in, and therefore they're going to become very popular and they're going to make a lot of money. Well, an agent is a pretty bright guy. Um, but and if, if, they, if they ever heard me say this, no, I'm not going to say it. They're equivalent to people that sell things. Use your imagination. Um, so he's selling his product, his jockey. But he's also very cautious on who he's selling it to. And he has a mental record and sometimes even beyond the mental record of just about what the talent of all the horses are and what race they are probably going to go, and this is called a condition book, and this tells you races that are coming up and what race you may be picking for your horse. And so I, as an owner, say, look, uh, I'm looking to race my horse next week in this uh, claiming race, and uh, this is my horse. You're going to get a call on your jockey, meaning that jockey will ride your horse. And he said, you know, I'll let you know. Well, he's going to let you know because he's going around to every other barn trying to determine if he's got a better mount a horse that he thinks will have a better chance in that race. And if he thinks your horse is going to have a better chance in that race, uh, he'll say, yeah, I'll give you the call. So now you have a guarantee that he's going to ride your horse. Now, the best jockeys get the best horses. And there's nothing, that, no one can argue that point. And the best jockeys have the best agents. And these guys are like croupiers down at the casino. They, they're just sharp as could be. You watch a guy count chips. I always say that's the same mind as an agent. He's counting. He's counting the same way. He knows where the money is. So that's a little bit what goes on behind the scenes in terms of um, jockeys and agents. And then the jockey uh, gives that agent 25% of what he wins of that 10%. And he also has what's called a valet. The valet is the guy that gets his saddle ready polishes his boots, um, does everything that's necessary, have his colors ready for him. So he runs in, he changes, and the valet has everything ready for him. And then he brings the saddle out and saddles the horse just the way the jockey wants it to be done. And um, because of that, he's entitled to 5%. So the jockey's giving some of his money away. In terms of jockeys, some of them make... Phenomenal money, phenomenal. If you're riding and you're bringing in purse structure of something like $10 million a year, um, you can figure that jockey's getting about 7% of that at the end of the day. Um, that's a lot of money. What else can I tell you about that? Um, probably anything you want to know. <laughs> so let's kind of continue and I'll get to a question and answer session if you'd like. You know, let's talk about who the players are in this game. 
You got the horse. He's the he's the primary player, or she. Um, and why why does a horse like to do this? That's what he's bred for. Why does your hunting dog like to hunt? Because that's what he's bred for. So don't think they don't want to do it. They want to do it. Then you have the owner. Well, why is the owner in? Well, there's a lot of reasons. At first, you have to say business because the IRS may be out here in the audience and the IRS is looking at this very closely. So your first objective is to make sure you're, you're keeping good books and that you're running it like a business. Uh, and that's very important because if it's considered a hobby, they're not going to accept your tax deduction. The other is it's a dream. I mean, it's a dream come true. Um, the other is you get a rush. Um, and then the others are prestige and social status. And those are the things that kind of aggravate me the most, to be honest with you. Um, for those of us who are in the sport because we love the sport and we're challenged by it, we see those that um, really enter the sport because they want to be identified. And syndication of horses today proves it more than anything. Um, for those who can't afford a horse on their own, they join these syndicates. Well, that's a nice thing. You can own a piece of a horse. But now the fights begin because um, you put up a couple of hundred bucks and you own a piece of a horse. And this horse wins and suddenly the winner's circle is flooded with people. And it's my horse, that's my horse, that's my horse. And these battles begin to ensue as opposed to a person who owns it individually, but they want that social status that I own a horse. And then there's the wealthy, the wealthy of the wealthy, the sport of kings. Um, the Withemer brothers in France are the wealthiest owner of horses. Well, why are they? Because their father uh, owned Chanel, Chanel Perfume. So they've invested as much as $10 billion in horse racing. The Queen of England uh, has a stable. She, of course, passed, but she raced in America a few times. She visited the Kentucky Derby. So there's um, that aspect of it as well. Saratoga is a perfect example. We're uh, winning a race in Saratoga. People will run a $50,000 horse for $25,000 just to make sure they get in the winner's circle and say, I've got a picture in Saratoga winner's circle. Okay, good for you. Uh, it cost you 25,000 bucks because I just claimed your horse. Then there's the, the, uh, the trainer. Why is he in it? He's in it for the money and a little bit of prestige. And the jockey, he's an athlete. Uh, he wants to win, but of course the money's a part of the motivation as well and recognition. And then there's you, spectator. And this is the second largest spectator sport in America, football being the first. And now we have the advent of OTB, uh, which you can watch from your computer, and many of you probably do. So uh, you can bet from your computer, TV, G, all of the above. Uh, so the sport has, has changed a lot from its infancy, from the time of King Charles to where it is today, and it continues to change. And now we turn to, you know, the dark side, the drugs, which I know everybody kind of keen on. Ah, oh, they drug these animals. Well, I can't tell you any sport that someone hasn't tried a drug in, be it uh, whatever. I mean, I see football players go back in at halftime and come out. They're lame when they go back in, and then all of a sudden they come out. And they're, they're not lame anymore. I wonder why. Um it's not as closely watched as horses. Horses are very closely watched today. Was it looser previously? Without question. Years ago, um, they would do two things. Horse, if it won a race, would have to go what's called a spit box. What is a spit box? That's a detention center in which they would wait for the horse to urinate and they'd catch the urine. And that urine would go get processed to see if there were any drugs in it. They would also take the saliva from its mouth and they would also uh, send that to testing labs and you'd have to wait to be sure there were no drugs in it. Today, it's primarily a blood test and a urine test. 
And the tests are so finite that a pictogram of any particular drug, and doctor, you would know more about that than anyone, uh, will show up. You know, parts per million will show up. And so uh, it's very closely watched. Those who have slipped under the wire have found drugs that they don't have a test for. And unless there's a test for it, you're going to get away with it. But they're perfecting these tests. And there's not too much that gets under the wire today. Um, most recently, four years ago, in fact, and that's what this 60 Minutes was about. There were two trainers. One's name is Jason Service, and the other's name was Jorge Navarro. Um, they had a drug, which was an enhancing drug, performance enhancing drug, that they were giving horses that was undetectable, but they were greedy. And I happened to know one of those trainers rather well. I gave him the start. Um, he was a very talented trainer. We parted ways over 10 years ago for other reasons. Um, but his greed got ahead of his talent and he got recognition and he actually won a Kentucky Derby. That horse was disqualified for other reasons. They um, found two drugs. One was called SDF 1000, I think, or something like that. And what it did was um, increase the amount of blood that a horse could produce. And the more blood it can produce, the more oxygen it can produce. And just like any athlete, if he has oxygen, he's got that second breath. Well, they got greedy, and Jason, in particular, was very capable of winning at a 20 to 25% with his, with his raw talent. But he struck upon his drug, and he was winning at 40%. Well, everybody in, the, in our industry said, this is not possible. There's something going on. They weren't able to discover the drug, but they were able to catch him on wiretaps because these guys are basically stupid. Uh, stupid to use it, number one, but stupid to talk about it, number two, amongst themselves. Well, the FBI got onto it, and they wiretapped him, and that's what they caught him on. They never caught him on a test. There's another drug, which is really interesting, called Monkey. Well, where did it get its name? Well, they would inject it in the joints. Well, there was a, previous to that, uh, a Patrick Biancon, which was a trainer, which is suspended, which is now back in the game again, he discovered Cobra Venom, that you could inject a joint with Cobra Venom, and it would deaden the pain if you had an arthritic knee, or maybe you had a chip in your knee, and you had your knee was hurting, so your your uh, performance was hampered by that. Well, if you inject it with the Cobra Venom, hey, I don't feel any pain today. I'm going to run. Uh, well, they, they caught on to that, and they, they figured out how to figure that out. But Monkey comes from South Africa, a tree frog called the Monkey Tree Frog. And on the skin of that frog is a wax. And from that wax is a pain-deadening substance. How the heck do people find this stuff? I don't know. But these guys found it. And they were using this on a, on a horse's joints. I don't think it was mentioned in that, but you can read about it. So there are two types of drugs. One is therapeutic, and we need therapeutic drugs. And unfortunately, they're really curtailing those which we need in horse racing as well. And the others are performance-enhancing drugs. So let's talk about the therapeutics for a moment. You're an athlete. You run hard. You're kind of achy. You know what? I think I'll take a, a Motrin. Um, well, the equivalent of a Motrin or, let's say, a Advil in the horse world would be butazolidin, which some of you take even as human beings. 
So, you know, after the horse is kind of a little achy, you can get him buta's all of it. Well, that was permissible up until, it used to be permissible up to 48 hours before a race. Now you, you, you're not permissible at all. Um, there are many other drugs I can talk about. Does it exist? Has it existed? Yes. Um, does it exist as much as this article makes it sounds like? No, it doesn't. The testing is so finite. And every trainer that I know is so afraid of someone coming into his barn and giving a horse something that could be detectable. I had a trainer. I still have that trainer. Very honest guy. Um, his horse was disqualified for Robitussin. I said, Robitussin? I didn't give a horse Robitussin. There was a pictogram of Robitussin in the horse's system. Horse could have picked it up any place. Um, grooms tend to urinate in stalls. Okay. So a groom's taking Robitussin. He urinates in the stall. Horse starts to nibble on the straw. And he ingests some Robitussin. So um, everybody's running scared. Now, at the end of the day, is it, is it better for the game? Yeah, I guess for those who feel it is, it is. For those of us that think that uh, there are some therapeutic drugs that that horses need is kind of like one of my trainers says, you know, once in a while you got to change oil in your car. And once in a while you, you got to help a horse. And we used to help them with steroids. We would inject them with steroids. You can still do it, but it has to be 14 days from the time you inject the steroid to the time that you can race the horse. So that's my comment on, on drugs, but I, I'm, I'm willing to talk to anyone or answer any questions you might ask about drugs that I can answer. So I, I think I've reasonably, you know, soaked up my time, and I hope I haven't bored you too much. Um, but I'd love to answer any questions if I can. Well, there's all kinds of insurance you can buy. You're talking about insurance on a horse? Sure. Um, I buy insurance on a horse that I think is worthy of it. You, there's two types of insurance you can buy. You can buy insurance on a claiming race. Let's start there. Um I want to claim a horse. I have what's called claiming insurance. So um, automatically, I claim a horse, and three days from now, he drops dead. Um, I've insured this horse before I even own him. Well, I say I'm going to claim. By the same token, the reason I say a claiming race, because I don't know what I'm getting out of a claiming race, okay? Now I have a horse that I have at home I want to insure. Well, I have to get a veterinarian certificate. This horse is perfectly sound. And then uh, they will insure up to two and a half times the stud fee of the horse. Now, stud fees can range all over the place. Um, if my horse um, succeeds at the racetrack and he's a $25,000 horse suddenly so becomes a $100,000 horse and he's competing at that level, I can get him insured for $100,000. The minute that I race him for less than $100,000, my insurance automatically drops to whatever level. But the answer is, yes, you can. You can insure your horses, if that answers your question, I hope. Any other questions? Sure. Okay. The question was why those are called pony horses that escort the horse to the gate. Is that what you're talking about? Okay, there's two reasons. You'll see sometimes that the horse exercises without that, and sometimes the pony horse is taking the horse around. There's one of the reasons is the horse, some horses will run off and they don't because they're so hyper. They know they're going to run. When you're going to run a horse, you what they call draw it in the morning, you don't feed it because you don't want it to have a full stomach. So the horse knows, hey, today's my day, I'm gonna run, and he gets pretty nervous and hyper. That's one of the reasons. Other horses are just so high-spirited that they don't want them to run off before the race, so they'll go out with a pony horse. Um, the other reason is sometimes the jockey doesn't want to get exhausted 
before the race. He may be a jockey can ride as many as 10 horses in a day. So they'll be escorted so that they're not using a lot of energy to hold this 1100 pound animal back. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Well, I, I think New Jersey's lost a lot of its glamour. This track's been sold so many times, and more recently, it's under a private ownership. State owned it at one point, but state really doesn't know how to run anything. Um, it's purses, honestly. The bigger the purses attracts the better horses, the better horses attract the better audience. And the more money that is bet, and the truth of the matter is without casino support, without casino support, most of these tracks would close up. Tracks have become interdependent on casinos. Um, and off-track betting as well. You don't have to go to the racetrack. You can sit at home and bet. Now, that, pardon me? Yes. Saratoga is fashionable. I, I mentioned that to you. Uh, I said that people do anything to win a race in Saratoga. It's a spa. It's a vacation place. Um, it just has the glamour. It just has the glamour. Uh, it's ostentatious. So everybody wants to be there, and everybody wants to be in a winner's circle. Yes, did you have a question? Well, I hope I haven't bored you folks, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. And, I hope you know more than what you knew before you came here this evening. Thank you.